We've been waiting for this day a while. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And here we are. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Amen. A lot of this reading, which Pastor John Barton shows, has to do with names, metaphors, ways to address a mysterious and majestic God. So I'd like us to play for a minute with names. I'm wondering if there's anyone in the sanctuary with the name Jack Harris Mandeville. Please stand up. <laughs> Look it! God knows his name. Is there anyone in the sanctuary with the name Danielle Elena Barton? She's in the play area. Raise your hand, Danielle! God knows and loves her. There is a man who will be installed today whose name is John Robert Barton, and he is loved and companioned by a woman named Sarah Taylor Barton, and God knows their every name. I've done introductions in a meeting, and I've said, please share all your names, thinking that there will be three. And then you get Catholics in the mix, and they want to add their confirmation name. Anybody have a confirmation name? Yes. And then you get people who've been married two or three times, and they want to add all their names. And God knows every one. My mother used to put me to bed sometimes and rub my head. She, she just died two years ago. Um, and she said, God knows your every hair, Lori. God is a good shepherd. But that good shepherd is just one name, one metaphor, one way of addressing a God who is beyond all that we can dream or imagine. And living as we do here in the suburbs of the Pacific Northwest, I'm guessing there aren't too many of you with real expertise in sheep or shepherding? Raise your hand. Okay, there's one, two, amen, three. Oh, that's beautiful. Four, okay, so you can correct anything I'm gonna talk about sheep in a minute. So be bold, keep me honest. But the truth of the matter is this image is one of the Gospel of John's favorite metaphors too. It appears over and over and over again but scripture is rife with other names and metaphors for God. So I'm wondering if you would be bold and not starting with this crowd right here. <laughs> What's a name or metaphor for God that's close to your heart? Shout it out. Father, beautiful. Love. Wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Love. Thank you. Yahweh. Creator, Comforter, say that one again, Holy One. In the Psalms alone, and we have a professor here who will keep me honest, there are dozens, right? God is my rock, God is a river, God functions as a midwife when we are born, and when we are bearing anything new, God treasures and holds it. In the Pacific Northwest, we might say, God is the precious trillium that comes out of the fungal network. God is a fern with ancient truth in every piece of its being. God is mighty river. We could just have this be my whole sermon, and that would be a lot easier, honestly. Um, we're meant to explore and to play. And if John Barton would have an installation in a year, he might choose an entirely different image. But my assignment for you, number one, because there will be a second one, is if you haven't already done this, See if you can find a name or metaphor for God that will companion you the rest of Lent. And then research it. 
play with it. How many times does it appear in scripture? What is the word in Greek or Hebrew? And what are the layers upon layers upon layers of meaning? The truth of the matter is in Holy Scripture, the story isn't finished. The story continues in you, the body of Christ. And that's good because if you look at the names of women in the Bible, only 111 have names. They're often the mother of, the mother in law of Peter, the bent over woman, the bleeding woman. How'd you like to be remembered as her? (laughs) Just over 100. But there are 1,400 men named over that. So women, men, non-binary saints, it's up to us to keep the story going and to be the body of Christ with all the boldness and shimmering glory that God gave you in your very creation. So when I asked Pastor John, what is it about the good shepherd that speaks to you, he said, it reminds me of what a pastor is called to be, someone who knows the name of every person and knows a bit of their story, knows a piece of what it is that they're yearning for, that God is not the grumpy judge sitting on a cloud Did anybody grow up with a grumpy judge image in their childhood? I did a little bit. I felt a bit of heavy-handedness in my childhood. God is also not ethereal as air. God is like the one, the grandmother of grace, who is waiting for your text and will respond with love. We all know grandmothers who might be texting you every day, Where are you? What you doing? Not that, but the grandmother who's ready to respond. One of my favorite stories, and I might tell it too many times because I love it so much, is that there was a boy, um, maybe six or seven. Some of you might be child development experts, and so you can tell me. that At the age where nightmares become a reality, you're realizing the world is more complicated than you thought. And so he said, Mom, I can't fall asleep. Mom, I can't fall asleep. And she said, as my mom did, God is right next to you. Just remember that. God is right next to you and folding you like a blanket. You are going to be okay. And the little boy said, I know that God is right next to me, but sometimes I need God with skin on. (laughs) And I suspect that many of you are here precisely because someone has seen you and cared about you and known you and loved you and in that moment became a caring God with skin on, a good shepherd who changed your life. I don't know that there's a pastor or deacon I've ever talked to who doesn't have a story of at least one person who profoundly influenced them and was the good shepherd who opened a gate into grace and not judgment or presence and not ethereal transcendence. And so the good shepherd is a reminder that God is with us always. I loved when I was practicing my sermon how many other images you have all around the edges of this space. I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me. I am the way and the truth and the life. I'm the bread. John, as you know, the gospel writer, John really was a poet. And his text is full of that. Luke was a feminist, in my humble opinion. (laughs) Because almost every story about a man will be followed up by a story about a woman almost every time. So watch for that when you read Luke. Mark, whose year we're in now, we're reading a lot of Mark in this lectionary cycle, is, according to, I had an indigenous teacher when I was in college, Mark, if an indigenous person were to write a gospel, it would be like Mark. Because Mark is the shortest gospel, and always there's action. 
There's not this flowery language of this and that. John has kind of long soliloquies. With Mark, immediately Jesus did this. And then immediately his followers did that. And that, that teacher, George Tinker, was one of the people for me who helped crack open the scripture. I really realized in a different way that it was written by human hands, though it can contain something far beyond what is merely human. So assignment number two, think about who has been a good shepherd, God with skin on. I'm preaching into this like I need to. God with skin on in your own personal story. And if they're still alive, drop them a thank you note. Thank you for being part of the gate of my faith, which changed my life. I lived for a time when I was first married in Pendleton, and I had a friend who grew up on a sheep farm, Lisa, in Australia. And because I was preaching in Pendleton as I awaited call, I said, Lisa, tell me about sheep and shepherds, and what do I need to know? And she said, sheep are very messy. If you're going to be a shepherd, you need to be willing to get into the muck and the mess with them. And she had sheep herself. She had just decided she would try it. And so she was looking for shepherds. And I said, what are you looking for in a shepherd? And she said, you need at least four things. They need to be tough because they're out, even now, they're out in these far-flung places and at most they might have a tent and some water that they carry. But they need to be tough and independent and self-reliant. And they also need to be gentle. The sheep need to trust them. I was thinking when, when we hear, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and that my own know me, what a miracle it is when someone in our family comes home and all they need to do is say one word and the dog knows who it is, right? The dog knows our voices and we, maybe not as perfectly, know the dog's bark. But we are known, transcending any language at all. We are known. So they need to be gentle enough that the sheep, and sheep are prey animals, and so they're very skittish. So in some ways, they need to be like a horse whisperer, a sheep whisperer. They need to be attentive. My friend Lisa, she invited me for um, the birthing season, and that's where I saw up close and personal the messiness of this project. Thank you. And... Um, she, she would say, this sheep is delivering for the first time, and so we're paying special attention to her because she's not as confident. This one over here has done it four or five times. She's good. She knows what's going to happen. So attentive to the uniqueness of each one. And then sacrificing, because even now there are predators. So the shepherd, the good shepherd, puts their body between danger and the flock. So I won't ask you to raise your hands on this one, but if you spend your time on social media and leave feeling inadequate because you haven't made the latest trendy dessert, or you're not wearing the most stylish fashion for women over 50. You know, I didn't even put that in, but suddenly it's like fashion for women over 50. Okay. It's good to remember that we have a God who knows us and who loves us and is attentive to us and will put God's self in the way of danger. We have a God who is a good shepherd. The good shepherd in grace sees our unique beauty as an indescribably shimmering child of God. And if you regret choices you've made, I love that confession that we shared today. 
If you regret choices that you made five minutes ago, God sees beyond our worst faults, our most grievous faults, and loves us anyway. And another thing that I love about shepherds is not the flock, only the shepherd decides who's in and out. A lot of times I've been in groups and I kind of would have liked to have said, this group would be better without that one person. Do you know what I mean? Oh, but yeah. the, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. But the good shepherd says everyone is included. There is no one left out. That's right. And we come as equals before this table and before our creator. And I've been reading a book. So this is a second assignment if you want to be an overachiever in Lent. Take up this book called The Forgotten Creed, Christianity's Original Struggle Against Bigotry, Slavery, and Sexism. And in it, Stephen, has anyone read it? Stephen, oh, I thought, oh, you're, yeah, you, <laughs> woo! Um, Stephen Patterson projects that in the earliest days of Christianity, people were baptized into those words that come to us in Galatians, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, we are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that became a central pivoting point around which everything else hung. The good shepherd doesn't see race. I mean, not in, the, not in that kind of way. But in Christ, okay, retract, retract, retract. In Christ, there's no such thing as gender. There's no such thing as foreigner. There's no such thing as enslaved person because we are all one at this table. Can you imagine how radical those words would be in a time when foreigners were feared, enslaved people were subhuman, and women were mostly property either of their father or their spouse? And suddenly we're being baptized into a good shepherd who recognizes all of us as equal. So I love that your pastor, John Barton, chose this metaphor for us. It's a healthy reminder of why I said yes to this call in the first place. Because I felt seen in church. And I went to a very competitive university. I did not always feel seen in that very competitive university. And then when it was time to interview for employment. I often did not feel seen by those interviewers. Can I hear an amen? amen. Right? Amen. But in church, we are meant to be seen. Mm. One shepherd that I was listening to on YouTube said, if left to their own devices, sheep will be in groups of about 20 to 25 so that they know each other well. And they're often matrilineal. They're led by a, by a dominant you. And so when we put hundreds or thousands of sheep together, no wonder they seem stupid, because they're out of their element. They're confused. Who's in charge? What's happening? But in my little campus ministry in Palo Alto, California, I felt seen and treasured and valued and known. And it was one or two people that made a difference. Amen. Beloved saints, one or two people in this room can make a difference for those children playing in the back or for the people who are shut in at home who cannot be here with us but are remembered because you call them afterward. We are meant to be loved so that we can love. We are meant to be blessed so that we can bless. It, it, it's not something that, that stops with us and we feel the glow. We are part of this living, incredible tradition of our ancestors, which is meant to remind everyone that we are holy. I was with the Conference of Bishops in Chicago last week, and we did something we have not done for a while. We put out some statements. If you can imagine 66 bishops 
from all over this country, very confident in their own theologies and opinions, <laughs> making a statement about anything. You can imagine how difficult that is. But when we heard the stories of what's happening at the border and how some migrants aren't being fed because politicians are <coughs> saying, you churches at the border cannot feed the hungry and you cannot clothe the naked for political reasons, and many of those churches are Lutheran, all 66 bishops agreed and we wrote a letter saying everyone bears the face of God in Christ and everyone is meant to be seen and clothed and fed. And we also address the, the horrors of what's been happening in Israel and Gaza and Palestine. And you can imagine that that one was even more complicated. But what we did was denounce the horrors of Hamas and the horrors of keeping hostages and the extreme injustice of bombing civilians, most of whom are women and children. And we denounced any anti-Semitic or anti-Arab or anti-Palestinian or anti-Muslim behavior in this country because as you know, that's rippling out too. And we are called to be a body of Christ that sees the face of God in everyone. And I can't tell you how profoundly good it felt when every bishop in that room gave a thumbs up. And within 24 hours, our Lutheran pastor friends in Palestine sent us a letter saying, thank you for seeing us. That's what they said, thank you for seeing us. The newest bishop is named Jeff Johnson. And some of you know his story. He was ordained in 1990 before gay and lesbian pastors were allowed to be ordained. But he felt a call to ministry and there was a congregation who wanted him as their pastor. And so he was ordained in 1990 and was in the extraordinary category, not on the roster of the ELCA for more than a decade. And he and two women served in San Francisco and largely served the gay community and those suffering with HIV AIDS. And they accompanied them every step of the way and upheld their dignity with respect. Well, years and years later, who was elected to be the bishop of that San Francisco area synod? Jeff Johnson, the one who wasn't even legally ordained. And at his ordination, the two women, Ruth and Phyllis, who served alongside him with extraordinary grace, leaned into me and they said this, Ruth, who's beginning to lose her memory a little bit, never let them make you bitter. Never let them make you bitter. Amen. And so I asked Jeff Johnson, now Bishop, where did that come from? And he said, you know, Christer Stendhal, New Testament scholar, wrote us a letter. Now I'm seeing gasps. He wrote us a letter, and that's where the word extraordinary even came from. So I'm going to read this. Christer Stendhal was one of my teachers at Harvard Divinity School. He was a bishop in Stockholm, Sweden, New Testament scholar, dean of Harvard Divinity School, came back as a chaplain when he had time. And I sat at his feet in his basement office and learned so much. But this is what Christer, seeing their dignity and their unique, shimmering beauty. To the ordinands, Ruth Frost, Phyllis Zilhart, and Jeff Johnson. Since I cannot be with you at your ordination, which it seems must take place extra ordinem, I want to send you a greeting affirming my conviction that the steps that your congregations and you are taking stand well before God. Then he talks about the irony of asking people to be celibate in the Lutheran church who are called to serve when wasn't that one of the bones that Martin Luther picked with the Roman Catholic Church? Then he says this, my conviction is also that it is right for your congregations to proceed in an extraordinary manner and find ways for your ordination. 
Church history in general and Lutheran history in particular supply precedents. The rather recent case of an Episcopal ordination of women priests, gasp, please, in Philadelphia, which was only later accepted by that church, makes it reasonable to expect that something similar will happen also for you. I am sure that you appreciate the magnitude of change in attitudes and thinking that new insight and openness as to gay and lesbian reality has brought into the church. Therefore, as you now assume a ministry of pioneers and a pioneering ministry, it is my sincere prayer that you be given much grace and joy in the spirit so that you can be preserved from bitterness and condescension toward those leaders and members of the ELCA who are not ready yet to rejoice with you. So we are called to remember that we are beloved of God. We are called to remind others, especially the vulnerable, that they are shining with the glory of the divine. And we are called to never let anyone who does not see that make us bitter or condescending toward them. So saints of West Lynn Lutheran Church, may you be accompanied well by this good and faithful pastor. May you walk the next steps into the fullness of who you can be. May you know that your ministry is not just beloved, it is important in this time and place of polarization and fear and demeaning in humanity in every corner. And please trust that I'll be praying for you and I'll be waiting for your assignments. Tell me in an email who is, what is your favorite metaphor or name for God you will be accompanying this Lent and what did you think of Stephen Patterson's book, which reminds us in the most ancient of ways that we too are baptized to remember we are all one and equals before our good shepherd. Amen.